I'm a big fan of unusual people, and this video is about a giant named Robert Wadlow. I've been fascinated with giants and little people and all sorts of special people uh, since I was a kid. One of my favorite shows growing up was called The Friendly Giant. And then in the early 60s, we passed a lighthouse for a subdivision called The Colony. Either my brother or my sister has mentioned that it was Friendly Giant's Castle, and I used to look at this thing whenever we passed it with like, my mouth wide open because it, it, it just was I kept thinking the friendly giant actually lived in it. I got to visit the colony a couple of years ago and sort of recreated that old picture. But uh, this video, I, and even, remember the green giant commercials? I mean, they were so creepy and so interesting. So anyway, uh, this video uh, is about Robert Wadlow. I take you to Alton, Illinois. I take you to my home in Palm Springs. I take you to Detroit, Michigan, and, and up to Manistee, Michigan, and back to Alton, Illinois. So, uh, and even Cuba, Missouri. It goes all over the place. So uh, join me on my journey, and you can't say I don't take you to different places. Hey everyone, Scott with Dearly Departed Tours here, and anyone who knows me knows that I like very special people, like Robert Earl Hughes behind me, or like Robert Wadlow behind me, Robert Wadlow, the tallest man in the world, 8 foot 11 inches tall, died in Manistee, Michigan, from Elton, Illinois, and look at that. <laughs> they have a little mock-up of his house here. Look at that. This is my Robert Wadlow collection of uh, ephemera having to do with Wadlow's life and uh, death. Now, this is an autograph I found when Wadlow was doing his a shoe store promotions he would hand out these cards and they'd be autographed now usually they were autographed on the reverse side of it so that's what makes this one just a little bit unusual but that's a real robert wadlow autograph uh these are x-rays that i bought on ebay i don't know why i spent like i don't know 10 bucks on these things they're just photocopies of his hand and of his skull which is uh just weird i guess these are items from the statler hotel in detroit and that is where he stayed before he died. My brother gave me that swizzle stick, and uh, I forget where I got the matchbook from. And you can see this uh, this cute little sideshow toy set, and uh, world's tallest man, that's Wadlow, and the world's smallest man, which would be Mishu, I think. And there's uh, Wadlow and Mishu, illustrated by dolls. And, uh, and that urn actually is the real Mishu. If you saw my last video, you saw that we have his actual cremains and we are uh, currently raising money to have him uh, inurned at Valhalla Cemetery in North Hollywood. And uh, there you are. Now, these were articles that I collected from, uh, again, they were eBay. I look for Wadlow stuff all the time. One of his toothp a toothpick holder of his came up a couple of years ago. I really regret not getting that. And very recently, a luggage tack came up and... Uh, I just didn't want to spend any that kind of money on it, but I really regret the tooth uh, the toothpick holder. But these are the Elton uh, newspapers from when he died. And when his funeral was held, this memorial card was uh, handed out to guests for friends and relatives. Robert Pershing Wadlow. 1918 to 1940, still on record as the tallest man in the world, the tallest human being on earth, still in 2023. And this is a, a magnet that they sell at Ripley's, believe it or not. I'm sure that Wallow family <laughs> sees nothing on those. Those statues are everywhere, though. You'll see a couple of them in this video. And this is an interesting uh, brochure for Robert Wadlow from Alton, Illinois, where the Robert Wadlow Museum is, and it's closed down. And I don't know what they're going to do with it. It really is quite annoying because uh, I made contact with them, and they were going to open it up for us when we went there, when Jordan and I were there. And uh, they just never returned our calls. So the Robert Wadlow Museum is still all locked up. It would be nice to be able to see it. 
And these are two items. I believe that he used to hand these things out when he did his personal appearances. And this is just a, uh, a little notebook that I got. And somebody wrote in this, a ball of white croquet thread, number 50. But this is a souvenir for Peter's shoes, who we would tour with. And he always handed out shoes, like a shoe, to all the different shoe stores. So a lot of times you'll see shoes on eBay for sale that belong to Robert Wadlow. They actually probably weren't. He would present shoe stores with a duplicate of his shoes. You'll see more of those at the end of the video. And these are, I guess apparently, the real size of his shoes right there. Eight foot 11 point one inches. So we're gonna delve into the life and death of Robert Wadlow today. In the lobby of the Best Western in Alton, Illinois. That's why. So we came here specifically to look up a gentleman, this guy here, the Gentle Giant, who's from Alton, Robert Wadlow. Eight foot eleven point one inches when he died in Michigan. So there is a tribute to him in the lobby here because he's probably one of the most famous Alton residents. There he is. So we're going to see today all the uh, locations relevant to Robert Wadlow. Is cut out his life size. So off to see Robert Wadlow's Alta. The Wadlow family home. Robert Pershing Wadlow was born on February 22, 1918, to Harold and Addie Wadlow. This was his childhood home. He was the oldest of five children. Well, his boards were creaking for him. Now, before they moved the house here, they would have had a completely different view out front, that's for sure. He was born weighing eight pounds, six ounces. And at six months, he weighed 30 pounds. The ultimate diagnosis for this issue was a pituitary gland disorder. He continued to grow at a fantastic rate. By kindergarten, he was five foot four. Now, Wadlow attended the Milton Schoolhouse, and this is the Milton Schoolhouse. They had to make a special school desk to accommodate him. Luckily, on the day that we were there, some renovations were going on and the doors were open, so we were able to get a peek inside the school where Robert spent some of his younger years. He was the tallest Boy Scout in Troop 1 at 7 foot 4. He had to have his uniform, sleeping bag, and tent custom made. Robert loved books, especially adventure stories, and they say that he read about 300 books a year. His diet, a typical breakfast during his teen years, consisted of 8 eggs, 12 slices of toast, several glasses of orange juice, 5 cups of coffee, and plenty of cereal. Eight 
1,000 calories a day. By the time he was eight years old, he was six foot two and a half inches tall and weighed 200 pounds. At 18, he became the tallest person in the world. When he was a young teen, he had an accident. He was pushing a child on a tricycle and he missed step and broke two bones in his feet. Afterwards, he needed leg braces and ultimately a cane to walk. There was a lot of weight to hold up. His family eventually settled in this home. So this was the address that was on actually his, uh, his death certificate. Nice little house. I guess it's early 1900s. Robert had a specially constructed bed that was over nine feet long. So he would have lumbered up these stairs. Oh my, I see a hand in the window. Now he was a friendly guy, easygoing. He enjoyed photography, and he earned the nickname The Gentle Giant. Up these stairs and through that door. And look at that. Maybe they're going to make this into a museum at one point. The neighbors are certainly a good guard dog. He didn't mind the crowds that formed wherever he went. One thing he didn't care for was the questions about what he ate, and he especially grew tired of people asking him, hey, how's the weather up there? After graduating from Alton High School in 1936, his intention was to study law, but he joined the circus. He was 20 years old when he hooked up with Ringling Brothers Circus. Now, despite the fact that his height was clearly the reason he was there, he tried to maintain his dignity by wearing smart clothes and not showing up anywhere near the sideshow. Of course, his size caused him a lot of trouble. Stuff that you'd consider normal became impossible for him. Going through doorways, ceilings were too small for him to stand up straight, and navigating stairs became treacherous. He had circulation issues with his feet, leaving him with virtually no nerve sensation, so if he did hurt himself, he wouldn't know it. That would ultimately lead to his death. Robert had a problem getting shoes that would fit him because he grew so quickly, so they had to be custom made. They cost about $100 a pair. Now this caught the eye of a shoe company who struck a deal with Robert. He would be a paid representative for the shoe company, traveling around the country, promoting the brand. He traveled with his father in a car, and the car had to be specially modified, basically by removing the passenger seat so he would sit in the back and he could extend his legs. He would often distribute a replica of one of his shoes to various shoe stores around the country. We're in Cuba, Missouri, in front of the Hayes Shoe Store, and Jordan told me about this uh, mural. There's a, this town is filled with murals. And uh, one of them is in this shoe store, and it was for Robert Wadlow, who uh, came through town on one of his promotional tours. And so the, we talked to a police officer who explained that there is uh, one of his shoes in here. So we came over here to see his shoe. And of course, the day we're here is Saturday. And that's the day it closes. But you can look in there, you can see the, stat, the picture stand up. And behind him, is a cabinet, and I'm sure his shoe is in there. The uh, officer said his mother met him here and said he was just a really sweet guy, and we talked about what a tragedy he is. Maybe I can go around to the other window and see. Oh, look at that, you can kind of see it. So, there's Robert Wadlow's shoe. I wish we could get in there. You know, we went to Alton again because, or we drove through Alton, Illinois, because we wanted to see the museum and the museum's closed for good. That was sort of what I've been waiting for to do this video about, uh, to get into the Alton Museum to see Robert Wadlow's things. But I guess it got water damaged and they had to close it down and it was all stocked with, uh, or all staffed by 
volunteers and nobody went back in. All this stuff is gone. Put in storage and they're looking for a way to do it over again. But uh, anyway, I'll reopen it. So that was disappointing. All right, so we're in Grand Circus Park in downtown Detroit. And that theater, well, it was a theater now. I think the whole thing's been gutted and uh, they left the marquee though. That's a, one of the theaters I worked in as a projectionist, the Madison. That's the old, uh, God, what was that called? <laughs> Grand Circus Theater, I think. I saw the Arrhythmics there a couple of times and B-52s. I think it's called a Grand Circus. But this is, this area is called Grand Circus Park. And around the corner, well, this is a circle. So I'll show you where the Statler Hotel was. And the Statler Hotel was significant because it's where Harry Houdini was living at the time of his death, which was here in Detroit, where he was staying. And uh, it was also where Robert Wadlow stayed when he was in Detroit, before he went up to Manistee. All right, so the Statler Hotel, where Houdini was staying at the time of his death, and where Wadlow, Robert Wadlow, stayed when uh, before he went to Manistee to die. That I remember the hotel being there. I've never seen it open because when I was working at the Madison, which was just up there, uh, it was all boarded up. All the windows were boarded up, and when they built this people mover thing. They, uh, they put fake awnings on the buildings because they were having, I don't know, it was a Democratic convention or something here. And, uh, and they wanted the people to be able to use the people mover through downtown, but they didn't want it to look as horrible as it really was. So they, uh, they put, just put awnings over the boarded up windows to, to give it the appearance of, uh, of it being lived in in a nice way. But yeah, the old Statler Hotel. This is one of the items in my Robert Wadlow collection. It's a memo book uh, that he was uh, he would give out when he was doing his appearances, when he was a representative for Peter's Shoes. Uh, Peter's Shoes were all leather shoes, and Robert Wadlow, since his feet were so enormous, was uh, asked to be the spokesperson for it. Now, Wadlow never thought of himself as a sideshow attraction, although he did work with the circus for a little while. Uh, he, he worked with the circus, but he wouldn't dress up. They wanted them to wear a tuxedo or something like that. He's like, no, I'm going to wear my normal clothes. He didn't see himself as a, an unusual... Well, he knew he was unusual, but he was, didn't consider himself a freak, and he wouldn't fall into any of that stuff. He considered himself in advertising. So he would tour the country uh, advertising Peter's Shoes. And when he was in Manistee, Peter's Shoes was actually located in that building that you see just to the left of the Vogue Theater right now. That was in 1940. Eventually, Peter's Shoes, or I'm sorry, Snyder's Shoes, he represented Peter's Shoes, but the shoe store was Snyder's, which was originally located on the corner, and it has since uh, moved about half down, half the way down that block, which is where we're going to see in just a moment. So Wadlow was actually inside those doors. The largest, these shoes were the largest shoes made for the human body. Each shoe is 19 inches long and weighs four pounds. They never stopped growing. His shoes, his body never, ever stopped growing. But he was the tallest man in the world. So this was the original location of Snyder's Shoes. Next to the Vogue Theater. All right, so we're walking down River Street to Snyder's Shoes. Your shoes are better. No, 
The people inside the shoe store couldn't be more kind. They were happy to speak to us and let me shoot some video inside and shared with us the scrapbook that they have of Robert Wadlow and his cool. stay in Manistee. Because he was in our, um, he came, um, so he was a fourth in the um, our 4th of July parade. The National Forest Festival, Festival is that yes. is that every year on the 4th of July? Mm -hmm. That's yeah, neat. Yeah, it's the National Forest Festival. So he came here on, you know, as one of those promotional events. Yeah. Obviously, and... Um, for International Shoe Company, that's the brand of shoes Snyder sold at the time, because we opened in 1938. So that's what, you know, brought him here. He was in the parade, obviously, never made it back out of town. So yeah. I think everywhere he went, he kind of... I think he left old it, shoes. A yeah. souvenir yeah. shoe, yeah. 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 The parade routes all went so different then, too. Yeah, so the, I'm not the picture even of him sure on the bridge where... has him leaving town. It's, uh, it's not heading well, into Well, yeah, it may have gone that way, and this one is probably they probably tried to get good, Snyder's in it that's good rich <laughs> oh. so he actually probably was going the other way because this is probably is that the building across from goodies I bet because it may be good rich tires where the um that shop Maybe. used to be yeah there used to be so a it's possible that this which there was a yeah, garage door there this could be goodies juice and java is down here and that could be the building right across from there because it had a garage door in it, and it looks like that says Goodrich. Um, so it, that's possible, which means that he would have been going that way. Okay, that makes um, sense. Potentially, obviously, with these dentals, a lot of our a lot of the buildings look that way, but it could very well be that one. But that one, I don't. Yeah, I can't even begin to guess where that would be. And they probably, obviously, took him probably all over town, even more so. After some searching, we were able to locate the actual route of the parade. There's one photograph of Wadlow in Manistee. We're on the drawbridge right now, actually, in Manistee. And uh, there's one picture of Wadlow, and there's a distinctive building behind him. And we went up and down Google Earth looking for that building. And we're crossing the, <laughs> the drawbridge and truck. Oh, my God, that's it. And it is. The building behind Wadlow is actually that control tower for this... Uh, for this uh, drawbridge. So the picture of Wadlow in Manistee is actually him in the back of a truck heading in this direction. So the parade was down there on River Street and he would have been coming back in this direction. And that photo was stamped right there. And he continued on in that direction. So I don't know where he was heading, but the parade must have been over, so probably back to his hotel, which is uh, which is where we're heading now. On the 4th of July, 1940, Wadlow was here in Manistee for the Manistee National Forest uh, Festival, and it was the fifth annual one at that point. Now, before he went, left Elton, um, apparently he had a blister on his foot, and since he was so big, uh, he actually couldn't feel it. He, they said he had numbing of his, uh, of his leg, so he didn't feel it, and it grew infected. So he had finished the parade and, uh, and then went back to his hotel room, the Chippewa Hotel, which was right over here. Now, as I said, he, uh, he had this infection in his foot or this blister that turned into an infection. So instead of taking him to a, uh, a hospital because of his size, they kept him in his hotel where they had two king-sized beds set together. And he actually languished for two weeks in those, uh, in those beds. Um, the infection just got worse and worse. He had a blood transfusion. They say during the entire time he was here, his temperature never went under uh, 106 degrees. Now, the saddest thing, I mean, is all the story is so sad anyway. This 22-year-old kid was desperate to get home because his grandparents were celebrating their golden wedding anniversary, and he wanted to go for the party. And uh, the doctor told him it wasn't likely. And his last words, his last recorded words were, the doctor says, I won't get home for the celebration. He died in his sleep on July 15th, 1940, in the Chippewa Hotel, which was where that lot is now. Now, uh, the following day, his body was on display at the Bradford Funeral Parlor, where an estimated 600 people came from out of town to see him and viewed his body before it was loaded onto a truck. A special casket was made at the Travers Casket Company, and his father accompanied uh, Robert's body 
to Elton, uh, where Elton, Illinois, where he had the uh, where his funeral took place. Now the hotel itself was around until 1985. It was uh, they were spending. It was in bad disrepair. I guess uh, vagrants were hanging out. There was graffiti. There was uh, uh, a lot of vandalism, and, and somebody said they were going to invest $9 million into it and buy some of the adjoining properties here. But mysteriously, in 1985, the place burned to the ground. And it's a shame, because Manistee's a really charming place, and there's lots of wonderful old buildings here. But the Chippewa Hotel is gone forever, where, Rob, where Robert Wadlow said goodbye for the last time. It was right there. The Streeper Funeral Home in Alton, now called Elias, Kalal, and Schaff, drove all the way to Michigan to pick up Robert's body. His coffin, made of redwood, was 10 foot 9 inches long and weighed 1,000 pounds. Now as a teen, he belonged to the order of, I think I'm saying this right, De Mole, a Masonic organization for young men. Then later he became a Freemason, and in 1939 became a Master Mason under jurisdiction of Grand Lodge of Illinois AF and AM. While his body was on display here for about 28 hours, it's said that over 33,000 people viewed his body. July 19, 1940 was the funeral. A crowd estimated at 1,000 jammed near the funeral home where the services were conducted by Reverend W.L. Handbaum, pastor of the Main Street Methodist Church where Robert Wadlow was a member. The chief of police estimated that about 5,000 people heard the services through loudspeakers. It took 12 masons and six undertakers' assistants to carry the casket. Flags were at half-staff at public buildings along the mile-and-a-half route from the funeral home to the cemetery. Robert's casket was so large, it couldn't fit in any vehicle. This is Oakwood Cemetery in Upper Alton. Masonic services were conducted graveside. His burial vault was steel reinforced to discourage souvenir hunters. This poor guy, he must have been in so much pain, so much agony, being traipsed around the country to sell shoes, which he loved doing. He loved being around people. I guess it's better than being locked up in a bedroom here and not be able to do anything. So uh, for 22, he saw a lot and did a lot, but boy, sure was limiting. So I hope you're flying around with the angels, Mr. Wildlow. You deserve it. You seem like such a decent guy, a gentle giant. See where I went with that? Gentle giant. Walking in someone else's footsteps. My first step so far away, guided by hands from above until I learned to walk alone. My hand reached across, then down. Then always down. Not that I was so, so tall, but everyone else so small. And there's the man. Look at that. I've come a long way to see you. All eight foot eleven point one inches of you. <laughs> Pretty cool. Let's have a seat. Replica of his chair. I want his chair. I want the real one.
I'm on the road, no, 7 feet tall, 12 years old, and I weigh 240 pounds. These boys grouped around me are in seven, they're in the same grade as I am, and they're about the same age. Uh, when I grow up, I hope to be a big man like Lindy if I can get a plane big enough. By the way, my size, size of my shoes are 25. 